Here we go. All right. Welcome to Simulation. Hey. I'm Alan Sakian, and today we have the pleasure of sitting down with Paul Pangaro. Hello. Hey. How you doing, Alan? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, it's a pleasure. I love coming to San Francisco, and this is an extra treat. Yes, and I will definitely have to stop by in Detroit. Yeah. Yes. I love your work. Thank it's you. It's amazing, Thank bringing you. some really important conversations to our world. Paul has an awesome background in cybernetics. Um, as president of General Cybernetics Bingo. for seven years and then now he is the associate professor and chair at the Master Fine Arts program of Interaction Design at yep. the College of Creative Studies in Detroit. And so that's also a very cool school. Interesting school, been around a hundred years. hundred year old school. Started in arts and crafts. Yep. And in that tradition, but uh, the master's program is relatively new. My program is only about three years old. Yes, yes. And this is a very important conversation because of sy systems thinking, I think is mm -hmm. a really important way to see the world. It's a lens with which to see the world. Uh, we just had Reese Jones on yesterday oh, wow. and we were talking in great depth. I actually messaged him last night wondering if the way that we were talking about biological systems mm -hmm. and the way we were talking about mechanical systems and sociological systems, if we could use cybernetics to describe that. And he said, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. In fact, cybernetics began as an interest in a wide range of disciplines to think about systems, no matter what they're made out of, but as having a purpose. Yes. It was a discipline that says, don't care if it's a cell or a body or a thermostat or anything, can we look at the world as a system as systems that have a goal. And if they have a goal, how do they achieve that goal? So that started in the 30s and mostly in the 40s. And it's incredibly influential still, although usually not by its name, because mm -hmm. it's been misinterpreted, as we've talked about a little bit. Um, but feedback, we have the word feedback in the yeah. zeitgeist now because of, because of cybernetics. If you go to the Google Ngram, you know the thing that plots mm -hmm. how many words have been used in the books that it happens to have, mm -hmm. but pr probably pretty representative. Feedback kind of goes along like this, and then all of a sudden in the 40s it goes Foom! and it, it, it's still going up. So yeah, feedback as a concept really good. started there, and it was formalized yeah. in a wide range of disciplines. Yes. And uh, I find it incredibly powerful in a wide range of areas, especially in interaction design. Yeah. And maybe you go ahead and tie in, let, let's get some relatable examples first and then sure. let's tie into sure. interaction design. So, um, so just some really, really simple examples would be, like you said, um, the purpose of a cell or the purpose of a body or the purpose of a mechanical system, like you said, a thermostat. Yeah, um, yeah go walk us down. So thermostat's a great example because we have it every day, but the prior example also helps explain what the word means. So people think of cyber this and cyber that because it's been used widely. William Gibson coined cyberspace in one of his novels, and that began this trend to have it mean a bunch of other things. But mm -hmm. you heard it here. Cybernetics comes from a Greek word meaning to steer or to pilot, as in piloting a ship. So what's that mean? That means I'm trying to go over there, and I start out, and I'm doing fine, and then I get blown off by wind and tide. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute. That's my actual goal, my desired goal. This is my current goal, my current state. So my goals are off. So what I have to do is I have to use this feedback of this difference. We call it error, mm. but we mean that in a good sense, mm. error that tells you what's wrong, not, hey, you made a mistake, mm -hmm. not that, mm -hmm. but an error, and you compensate for that error by turning this way, and then maybe you get blown this way by wind and tide, and you go too far, and so you have to compensate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So this act of steering, of yep, yep. acting, sensing, comparing to what you want, acting, sensing, comparing to what you want, and then correcting. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a simple yeah. feedback loop. Yeah. And that's the meaning of cybernetics, yeah. to pilot or to steer. In fact, I'm told, uh, in Greek, it means the art of steering. Of steering, yeah. Not just, that's, that's great. not just steering. So that's the basic example. Thermostats work the same way, right? You've got the temperature in a room, and the sensor says, well, it's a little bit cool in here, so I need to turn up the heat. So the air gets warm from the heater, the hot air enters the room and changes the sensor. The sensor sends its signal to this comparator and says, well, am I on course or off course? Mm -hmm. Do I have the right temperature or not? And it gives the heater the proper instruction. 
whether to stay on or to go off. And simple feedback is that Yes, way. yes. And it's so important, it's hard really to emphasize. Every intelligent system has intelligence because it has this feedback relationship with a given environment. Mm -hmm. I don't want to jump ahead, but there's a thing in AI that says, that's an intelligent machine. Well, well wait a minute. In what context is it intelligent? Mm -hmm. In some context, a thermostat is really smart. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, when it's 20 degrees below zero, and it's never that way, it's not very smart mm -hmm. because it can't mm -hmm. manage that mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. So it's designed for a certain range of capabilities. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the core of cybernetics. Mm -hmm. The other thing to think about is that it's a circular thing. Yeah. And, and not just going in circles, as in ending up in the same place, but it's a spiral. You yeah. advance, you go forward. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's perfect, the, the Greek word to steer, the art of steering. Yeah. It really explains it well. Yeah. And also the circular system. So it's, it's you, you do something and then you analyze what you did yeah. and then you steer yourself yeah. again to the next and then you do yeah. analyze steer. You're, you're constantly comparing to what you want, what you have. Mm -hmm. Now that's first order feedback. Mm -hmm. What might happen though is along the way you say, well, is this the thing I really want? Is there something else I could want? And then you can change your goal. But, but wait a minute, mm -hmm. this first order loop is just worried about the goal that you've set. If something else changes your goal, that's an outer loop. So now you have a second order of oh. feedback. The outer loop changes the goal of the inner loop. It's like we say, hey, let's, uh, let's go to dinner. And then we work on it for a while and we decide, no, there's no good time. We don't have food tastes in common mm -hmm. and so on. But then we say, well, wait a minute, why were we going to dinner? Uh -huh. Well, because we just wanted to talk. Well, let's, let's just talk over tea. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. So this consciousness of setting goals and mm -hmm. questioning those goals is something that cybernetics lets you do mm -hmm. consciously and explicitly. And before that, there was no science for that. So what did you mean in your video when you said that science mostly takes a linear approach versus cybernetics takes a cir circular approach? Yeah, give us an example then of the scientific linear one. Heinz von Forster was this extraordinary uh, Viennese character who wrote very, very eloquently on a lot of these topics, and I recommend reading him. Von Forster, he's von a real, Forster. really tremendous influence on the, on the first generation of cyberneticians, which by the way included Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson and John von Neumann and, and Norbert Wiener, who wrote yeah. a book called it, and many others yep. that you may know. Um, but Heinz used to say, remember that science comes from the same wor root word as schism, which means to cut. Uh, uh -huh. And he would then explain that science works because it tries to explain something this big and it says, well, no, that's too complicated, I can't do that. So let me just look at this narrow thing. No, wait a minute, that's kind of hard. So let's narrow it down to this little tiny piece of, piece of the world, right? We're gonna look at some photons now or we're gonna look at some you know, thermoelectric effect over here. And it's cutting and cutting and cutting until it's so small that you can say something about it. Now what you can say, the scientific law, it's profound. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, that's really powerful. Yeah. E equals mc squared, oh my God. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that you've cut the world into tiny pieces and you've said A causes B. And you've said something profound about that, but you haven't allowed, you disallow in science, A causes B causes C causes yeah. A. Yeah, 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 yeah. So basic science is all about splitting the world into smaller and smaller pieces, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas now we have system science, and that is interested in these circular causal things that yeah. go on and all of that. Uh, but cybernetics has at its, as at its core this idea of circularity. Yeah. And that's what Heinz first said. Good, that was a good explanation. I, we yeah. typically host very, very smart scientists that have went super far in depth in their field yep. and a lot of time they will have cut 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 yeah. cut cut down 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 and it's really profound the realization that they get at this very very small yes, fabulous yeah, level and then that can typically help with something like uh, disease or can help with something yeah. like an advancement in technology which yep. is great uh, and then furthermore 
to take that discovery and to try and figure out how it plays a part in the system. That is the next kind of step in the direction of maybe science relating to the direct linear, but then also how it relates to the well, system. Well, why do we need the phrase systems science? <laughs> that says that science is not of itself systemic in this way that we want. As Heinz used to say, science can say more and more about less and less because it's cutting things down in this mm. way. He also used to claim that science comes from the same word as shit, but, but I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> I, he said that, but I, I, I can't yeah. verify that. So, okay, so the, let, so the example, we have thermostat, yeah. we have boat, um, we have, you know, the, even the human body yep. um, has so many weight. I mean, you, you're, you're hungry? Well, what's your, what's your action? Eat a banana. Yeah. And once you eat the banana, what do you realize? Oh, you're not hungry anymore. Okay, back, exactly. to, back to work. Um, so there's, there's many different ways to... So I guess, uh, let, let's ask about how this applies to interaction design. I think sure. that's going to be really interesting. Great. And then um, I think we have a couple other really good avenues to walk down um, as well. So yeah. I'm, I'm sure you do. Yeah. That's great. Well, in this program that I chair in Detroit at the College for Creative Studies in Interaction Design, the invitation to take the job was to design the curriculum. And for some years, I've taught with a close colleague, Hugh Duberly, a course uh, when I was in the Bay Area uh, at Stanford for Terry Winograd, a course essentially in cybernetics and design. And the idea was that if you learned how simple feedback loops work, and then how nested feedback, loop, feedback loops work, then you can imagine designing for this thing because if I do something, it tells me it heard me, or it vibrates, or it blinks, or it disappears when I touch it. So simple feedback like that. It's yeah. a bit like when I, when I come to this, mm -hmm. I get to it, and that gives me feedback. So simple mm -hmm. feedback. But more so, and much more subtle is, what are the possibilities I have here? How can it express to me, if it thinks I'm trying to do something, make a reservation, how does it expose to me the options related to that reservation. And that's, a, that's the idea that I can change my mind and I can change my goal and so on and so forth. So interaction design begins with feedback. Mm -hmm. Another aspect that's a little deeper is how powerful is the thing that I'm being given? For example, a thermostat in this room can heat the room when it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but it doesn't do so well when it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit because it's been designed to work within a range. Yeah. And there's a very important idea in cybernetics called variety, which is the capacity of a system to respond to the disturbances. It's like in some boats, if I'm piloting a ship, back to the example, some storms I can go through mm -hmm. and some storms I can't mm -hmm. because that's a fundamental limitation of the design of the thing. Mm -hmm. So it makes students aware of limitations of their designing and forces us all to be conscious of those limitations. Mm -hmm. But where it gets really interesting and this was a revelation to me when I first came across it, was in order to understand things and to go through pre-existing patterns, but also to imagine new patterns, to examine what I know and to learn what I don't know, requires a conversation. Yes. And even in my own head when I'm saying, should I do this or this, that's a conversation. Mm -hmm. So this is a conversation. You open with it, right? How is it a conversation? Well, as a consequence, we know different things after than before. Mm -hmm. So I've learned some things about you, hopefully mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we learn what's possible through conversation. Mm -hmm. And if you learn what's possible, then you have more choices. And if you have more choices, then the world is a better place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, again, back to Heinz, he had something that he called the ethical imperative, mm -hmm. which is, I shall act always so as to increase the number of choices. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I shall act always to increase the number of choices. And as a designer, that's the most ethical thing. So I'm an interaction designer, and I'm constraining people by what I, by what I do and don't put on the screen. But if I constrain their choices too much, that's a little bit of a wiggle word, how do I get around this problem of overly constraining people? 
it's a serious issue. So on Amazon, mm -hmm. I've got a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's not good for me. And so mm -hmm. students say, well, you don't show the people the bad choices for you. Who says they're bad choices? The designer, mm -hmm. the person, et cetera. So it's a very, very yeah. complicated thing. I've, I've gone deep in there all of a sudden. It's a very complex thing to imagine how you can help people understand their choices and design an environment in which they can increase their number of choices. But you need conversation to do that. Mm -hmm. And so studying conversation as a system that has an evolution, that gets somewhere, that sets goals, changes goals, proposes and removes and elaborates goals is critical to interaction design. So there are a series of models which Hugh Dubberly helped me we together worked out when we first started at Stanford, and we now teach it in individual places when we go out into the world and take these ideas. And these models of interaction and conversation are absolutely foundational. And they're, they're pure cybernetics, in my sense of the word, which is this historical discipline, which is all about understanding purpose and expressing systems that have purpose. Yeah. And would you say that the idea of interaction and feedback that goes back in evolution very, very far, but when were the first times that we became conscious of it? Was it around the, right around the first proto-language time? This is not my province, but I would venture to say that language is the beginning of consciousness. Mm -hmm. that, that it, I mean, it's a slippery slope. Philosophers have been arguing it for a long time. I conform to the definition that comes from cybernetics, which is awareness is me apprehending things, perceptual things. And consciousness is us sharing an understanding of that apprehension, sharing. So shared awareness is consciousness in okay. cybernetics. It's okay. not quite what other people mean. That's, that's good though, I like that, yeah. yeah. So, so I have the awareness of this feedback, and then if you also have the awareness, then it's shared If we are aware of the other having the awareness, yeah. then we share something. Then we have a social system. Yeah, yeah. And Correct. then with language, we right. elaborate and evolve that social system when we create culture and society and yeah. monsters and yeah. happiness and grief and all kinds of things. So the, so the fundamental layer is to have some sort of shared yeah. consciousness yeah. between people yeah and so th and that's why when you when we look at the world around us we don't see people on transit systems that just start punching people that's a shared consciousness to not do that well be civilized yes I, I mean there are some steps in between yeah. Uh, yeah and and one of those steps is agreements not just that this is making a noise and that there's something here, but rather an agreement about what we value. Like paper currencies function in society. Yes, that's a good example. Another name to mention is Umberto Maturana, who's a Chilean biologist and I would say cybernetician, still alive. Very, very influential in many communities, including the cybernetics community. He's sort of second generation to Heinz von Forst's first generation. And uh, Maturana says that we need to decide what we want in order to move together in a coherent society. And that's about what we value, that's what, what, what we would call it. But the fundamental that he says in a wonderful uh, essay he's written called Meta Design, so Meta Design and Maturana will find that. Yeah. He says, um, what do we want to conserve? So we have this technology and we want to go to Mars and we want to build electric cars and maybe we want to save the planet and maybe we don't, but, but what do we want to conserve as all of these changes are happening? And his fundamental is, do we want to conserve the value of living together? That's an open question in some societies. And if the answer is yes, then we can decide mm -hmm. what technology we make or don't make, yeah, yeah. what actions we take or don't take yeah. in the world. So there's a kind of cadence here. Shared experience somehow led the nervous system to be able to create a language 
for describing and coordinating and layering up concepts and values and knowledge. Yeah. And these things are agreements in a kind of flux world. It's not about the physical world, but it's this mm -hmm. space of agreements, right? This social stuff that goes on. And in that social space, we create norms or um, laws sometimes, or yeah. rules, which is, I'm not going to punch you in the face when I see you on the subway. Yeah. And as a consequence of that, we can build further and build further and build further, or not, or we can destroy. Yeah. That's also up to us. H having this sort of species agreement mm. about some fundamental principles mm. seems to be really important with the proliferation of technology. Yeah, I just, uh, we're just approaching too many possible extinction scenarios yes, yes. to not have this global conversation about we're, and we just came out of an extinction scenario with nuclear war. Right. Um, so I'm just, I just <laughs> why are we not uh, having a full-fledged global conversation? It's interesting that it's taken us to the scare of AI to worry about this in a more serious way, I hope. I hope it's not lip yeah. service. Yeah. I mean, all the big companies are joining nonprofits that are about ethics and AI and, and blah, blah, blah. And you have people on one side saying, you know, as the Monty Python thing goes, we're done for, we're done for. And then you have the people who say, it's going to be fine. And then you get Jaron Lanier, who's, you know, kind of brilliant third point of view, where he says, no, wait a minute, you know, this is ridiculous. What, where can we go here? Mm -hmm. And he's written, I think, quite eloquently about a middle space that's in between. Tristan Harris yep. has also been talking recently. Good friend. Great, yeah, yeah, I know Tristan a little bit. Um, and I think he's done extraordinary work. He was the seer who saw ahead yeah. in these issues. Um, but the global conversation about what we want to conserve, even while we're, we're obsessed with this, I mean, it's amazing how much, how are you? I'm, you know, g give me a minute, will you? I want to check, I want to check a few things here. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm checking out. Can I, I mean, it's just, it's a strange world, you know, yeah. four people at a table, two parents and two children, all on their phones. Anyway, um, Kevin Kelly wrote a book a while ago, I think it was a book called What Technology Wants. I'm not a violent man, but that really pissed me off. Because attributing to a technology a desire, no, that's, that's irresponsible to suggest that we are not responsible for the technology we make. Yeah. And again, Maturana yeah. is very eloquent on yeah. this. We, we just, technology doesn't determine us, unquote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We determine what the technology is to be. And that's a question of what we wish to conserve, what our values are. Yeah, it, it, again, just seems to be such an important conversation to have is, Completely. again, what are we doing with the smartphone technology? Yep. Um, how are we leveraging that? How are we leveraging the good in that? How are you being aware of the bad? Same thing with all these other technologies that are emerging. So the systems thinking apply to interaction design. I'm very interested to hear about how um, these sort of feedback systems are part of how um, your students are designing. Mm -hmm. So what have been some of the interesting designs that they've come hmm. up with that you've been able to, that you could share with us? It's hard to just talk about them. It would be fun to show you the diagrams or the yes. clickable prototypes um, that they've played with. Um, let me give you one example of a conversation system, if I may. Yeah. Uh, a student of mine, uh, Chia Min Lin, has always been interested in social justice. And the project at the end of the cybernetics course is one in which they can take any of the models that they've learned, first order feedback, variety, second order feedback, bio cost, which is something we might get into, and conversation. And they can look into the world and find a system that they want to express using any of those models. Yeah. And she picked up the story of the Korean comfort women, Korean women during mm -hmm. World War yeah. II, you know the story who were conscripted, I don't know what the right word is, 
to provide services, sexual and otherwise. And she mapped a conversation between the US government, the Korean government, and the Japanese government about who would say what to the other in order to get what outcome for whom. And it comes out on a big poster. Now this is a set of nested feedback systems mm -hmm. where I, the US, say I will give money to this group if this group does the following thing for yeah, me. Yeah. Or I will establish uh, arms um, in a particular place, uh, defense, military defense, for the sake of this government if this government will pay this money to this group in order to compensate for this. I'm waving my hands, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And she used the models from the course to express the various feedback systems involved in that. So that's, that's an, an out there example. Um, closer in would be simpler examples of redesigning um, Reddit or redesigning uh, Facebook mm -hmm. to have different kinds of feedback. What well, were some of those? Well, ac actually, uh, a student now is working on a thesis. Um, Puja Iparie, she's concerned that WhatsApp, WhatsApp in India is a primary means of communication, including news mm -hmm. for an entire demographic, 20s, 30s. And the problem arises that coming into WhatsApp, an encrypted environment, is this fake news, and this person just proliferates it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So could you have an interface which would encourage an individual who's seeing this story could consider, is it coming from a reputable source? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is it recent or old? Yeah. Um, have others um, attributed veracity to it or not? How do you interrupt somebody who's looking at a thousand of these yeah. all the time to get certain criteria and to spend less than five minutes, which seems to be the, yeah. the threshold, and judge what's going on? So this is feedback to an individual to consider criteria that she's established based on a yeah. fair amount of research. And if they say, well, wait a minute, you know, is that really a reputable source? And then you can expand that and see quantitative judgments and other criteria that come along. She's essentially got 25 different criteria for establishing whether or not a story is valuable, has high quality, is worth believing or not. Mm -hmm. And of course, She's not trying to deal with the issue of the pure lie. She's trying to deal with the issue where, well, you know, some people might consider that true mm -hmm. and other people might disagree with it and so on and so forth. So it very quickly rises to the level of sophisticated interactions and sophisticated conversations rather than simply, yeah. you know, it, it, is it getting warmer in the room or not? Yeah. She would be good to link up with our friends over at The Knife Media. They mm. strip bias out of news and they yes. show you the bias that they strip out of news. So yes. it'd be good to That's a lovely them. idea. Let's, let's pursue that. Yeah, let's make, we will, we'll make sure to connect them. That'd be great. Um, I'm glad that students are working on such you know, applicable examples of. Yes. And, it, and you know, that's also similar to the Tristan Harris getting a notification uh, when I text you that says that, oh, Paul is currently in busy mode. Do mm -hmm. you want to break his busy mode? Right. Um, similar to when you're reading the article to get a notification that says, hey, only 12% of people have said that this is real news, right. um, et cetera. Right. Yeah. F feedback, all, all feedback of all kinds. And then you steer from there. You adjust yeah. and steer. Yeah. 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 Um, so when yesterday when we were talking about all these different biological and mechanical social systems, mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about cybernetics and cyberneticians. Yeah. Cyberneticians. Yeah, that's that's I love that. Yeah, Nick, right? Yeah. It's Cyber it's a little more British than what's the other one? I always forget the other one. Um Cybernauts. No, oh, I'm only cyber kidding. I'm only kidding. Yeah. Um there's an Americanism that I don't like as much, which I've repressed, obviously. Cyberneticians is more British, I prefer, because mm -hmm. I learned from a British cybernetician. C cyberneticians. And I wasn't thinking so much about cybernetics yesterday uh, until really tonight or last night when I was really going into more depth in, in the subject again, because 
in our conversation yesterday with Reese Jones, it, we were talking so much about biological systems mm. such as uh, methylation with genetics, with, de with genes. Mm. Uh, and I mean, that's a really good example of getting feedback when your gene turns on for tooth growth or for puberty or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, again, it's just, that, that's, just, that's a biological one. And then yeah. we have the, um, the mechanical ones of thermostats. We were discussing that one and social ones like needing to eat a banana. Again, that's also biological. And yeah. I have, a qu I, have a, I have a good question for you about this. Yeah, go ahead. It's go cybernetics ahead. all the way down. It's cybernetics all the way down. <laughs> and check, so, okay, check, out, check this out. So Reese and I were talking yesterday about how a, a, we, I got him to give a percentage. And he said it was about 1% is actual free will. And the 99% is you're just a node on the network in cybernetics. So do you have a percentage that you think is actual free will of you deciding to eat the banana or the apple, or is it actually a uh, whole systems thinking with your biology and your microbiome that's, that's indicating to you whether or not you should make the choice? Same thing with the temperature and cold or warm, same thing with um, your social cues, you parsing fake news, is that all evolution from the past 10 years of your mind developing, et cetera, where do you think, you, where do you think we fit on the free will applied to cybernetics sort of? So this landscape? is where we drift into the philosopher's corner again, uh, free will being one of those topics. I think the first comment as an intro is, it depends on the complexity of the system as to whether or not you can comprehend it or not. For example, a thermostat and a heating system is very simple. Biology is very complex, but I can imagine knowing it. The brain is another whole crazy thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think we will understand how the brain works. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anyone has a clue, despite what everyone is saying, and I could back that up, maybe. Um, I believe that we're a deterministic system. I don't think there's a soul, there's other agency, I don't think there's anything affecting me, I don't think there's quantum mechanical signals coming from a remote dark star that is mm -hmm. determining mm -hmm. anything. It's, I don't go there. Tom Gruber, a, f a friend from when I was here in Silicon Valley, I haven't been in touch with him lately, uh, said during a conversation with an informal club we had, it was a chief technology officers club we started in, uh, in 97 when I first came here. Uh, he said, so Paul, you're a materialist. I thought, oh my God. Uh, but yes, I, I don't believe that there are these other agencies. But as Heinz von Forster, again, it's great always to mention Heinz, pointed out, um, even though there's nothing affecting what's going on in my body other than what's in my body, it's unpredictable because of the scale of complexity of it. There's just too mm -hmm. much going on to be able to predict. Uh, don't get me started on uploading consciousness, by the way, because then you'll have to tie me to the chair. That's a hint. Um, so free will, some people say, is a myth because the, the organism is essentially a, a determined machine, a deterministic machine, it just does what it does anyway. Um, and I think as a materialist, I have to agree that that's, that's true at some level. Somehow I make up stuff that makes me think I'm really deciding. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, if consciousness is part of the deterministic machine and I am doing an evaluation of possibilities, I do, t I do partake, I have an agency in that. But, uh, so how much steering are we doing? So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm trying to get to where you're going. Thanks yeah. for bringing me back. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of steering, and yet we can't deny the point about the other 99% that you just brought up. There's so much stuff going on out here that in front of me now are not many choices. Yeah, yeah. So I have water here and maybe some water that's in this. I'm not going to drink that. I'm thirsty. I'm mm. going to drink this. Yeah, yeah. So, the world, the context, determines an enormous amount. Um, I think every day, I'm thankful every day I wake up for the world existing because I can't keep in my mind everything I would have to remember if the world didn't exist. So the world is partly my memory. Yeah. I don't have to talk about a wristwatch or a, a mobile phone or an implant to say that we're cyborgs 
-hmm. the world is, is in a sense helping us be cyborgs because we're not just the organism, we're the organism in the environment. And again, intelligence is a property between systems. It's not a property of a system. I am intelligent in some situations and I'm dumbass in other situations. So just talking about intelligent machines I think is a false premise. One of the many in the world today. So I don't know that I have a percentage, uh, one percent. You mm -hmm. know, I, 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 the question is a little bit rhetorical in the sense that you're trying to get a conversation going. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I don't think I can quantify it other than to recognize that I'm constantly influenced by what's here yeah, yeah. and what's not here. And yet I do feel like I do have a lot of choice. I, I don't think yeah. I would enjoy my life as much as if I thought that the choices I make, whether what song I sing or what plane I get on, is not something I'm doing choice. myself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, how about with choice, uh, e ethical... Mm. Well, you said that and you made a wonderful face. The following word. Ethical conversation? Ethical conversation? Uh, oh, no, ethical... Interface? Ethical... I'm not sure where you're going. What was the imperative? Word? Imperative. Oh yes, the ethical okay. imperative. I'm so sorry. the yeah. question about the ethical imperative yep. is, within choice theory, do we want to enable people to have trillions of online choices? Is that is it better to continue exponentially growing that uh, rather than being like maybe there is some educational content that. Uh, eight-year-old or a 12-year-old should be checking out at the dinner table? Beautiful question. So once again, Heinz von Forrester to the rescue. And he conceived this before we had mobile phones to proliferate our choices, or whatever they are. They're not really phones anymore. And he made a wonderful distinction between choices and options. In fact, there was a whole period when people were misquoting him of saying, you know, increase the number of options. And I'm like, no, that's not what he said. And he would talk about this. He would say, I, he would say that he doesn't mean, I, we are proliferating a trillion options. But out of that trillion options, how many are viable for me right now? Oh, sure, sure. So maybe there's how only many 25 the, or something that are... How many of the ones I might choose because they yeah. fit me? Yeah. Within which I would choose to be who I am or choose to be who I wish to become by making that choice. Which is a pretty decent way to understand newsfeed technology, the newsfeed algorithm. So that brings it down to 25 choices from a trillion options. And then furthermore, then you parse the 25 to find the one that you want to read, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So we've helped a little, mm -hmm. right? We've gone from a trillion to 25. Yeah. But how then do you make those options possible to explore, I should have said choices, the narrowed choices possible to explore in a way that I call humane. So I'm working on an idea now called the humane interface. Can mm -hmm. I ask you to participate in a parable? I, I would love to. And then I'll, I'll be able to get to the point. Yeah. Ask me where there's good pizza. All right. Paul, where is there good pizza? I'm glad you asked me that, Alan. There's fabulous pizza right across the street at Luigi's Pizza. Mm -hmm. Now ask me why is it good pizza? So why is Luigi's Pizza good pizza? Screw you, I'm not gonna tell you why. <laughs> why won't you tell me why? Well, I'll tell you in a moment why I won't tell you. But you can tell me now, why doesn't Google tell you? Because I just described Google. Uh, uh -huh. It says, here's the first choice. I'm not talking about sponsor. Yeah. First choice, second choice, third choice. Yeah. I can't say, thank you, Google. Really great, wanna know more about Luigi's. Why did you say it's good for me? Or why did you say it's good in general? Or why did you say this review is better than that review? You're not telling me, you're not transparent. I claim that is not ethical. Mm. Now we know why they don't tell us, right? It's proprietary, it's algorithmic, you can game it if, you, if people know, blah, 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 blah. But that doesn't satisfy me. Same thing can be said about what you see in your news feeds as well. That's where I'm yeah, going. Yeah, okay. That's exactly yeah, where I'm yeah. going. If you're not transparent about it, you're being unethical. I would reject you as a friend if you wouldn't tell me why you're saying the things you're saying. Uh -huh. I would reject from another human being lack of transparency. Yeah. Why do I allow a machine to be not transparent? 
Yeah, yeah. If you were coming onto the show and uh, I wasn't telling you why I'm doing what I'm doing, right. you'd be like, I'm not coming onto your show. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And uh, if you were uh, a, like a partner of mine, like a romantic partner, and then you were withholding information from me, I'd be like, you're not being transparent or we don't need a date anymore, etc. This word trust is coming up here. Right? Yeah. So how can you trust a, a, an interaction mm. where you don't feel like it's reliably transparent yeah. in what it's telling you and why it's telling you that? And very similar to where our taxpayer dollars go in the government system. It's endless. Yeah. It's, it's really endless. So we're on this path about choice. And I have in front of me now, you have given me, Google has given me 25 choices. It's inhumane if, sorry, it's unethical mm -hmm. if I can't say why was Luigi's Pizza good pizza. Yeah. And again, there are classes of goodness for making it a choice for me. It could be other people's reviews. It could be its opinion, your opinion. That's fine, but I want to know. Your opinion is, the opinion of a thousand reviewers is, the opinion of a service, <coughs> bless you, thank you. The opinion of a service that's making a thousand dollars on showing you this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's perfectly fine if you say you make money by proposing something, then yeah. I can judge. Yeah, yeah. Right? Transparency, yeah. Transparency about all, all mm -hmm. of these different aspects. So all of this, uh, I think, is quite important. Especially as we move into interfacing with more and more machines. Yes. Yeah. Humans don't get away with being non-transparent. Why, yeah, like Why should machines? Yeah. And then there's a problem of machine learning, where even the machine doesn't know. Mm. Right? The neural net thing. Mm. It doesn't have criteria that it can share with you. It's looking for patterns. Mm. And those patterns are meaningless in terms of categories or values or preferences. So machine learning is another whole bag of worms when it comes to transparency. And that's a known issue. I'm glad of that. Mm. I'm not sure that parables like Luigi's parable, mm. Luigi's pizza parable. I like that one. That's a good one. I, I think it's effective in, in making the point. If I'm in front of a group of students or uh, in an audience, and when I say, I just described Google, there's a gasp. It's like, whoa, yes, you're talking about Google. We accept this from Google and Facebook yeah. and, and other recommendations. You don't know your, you, yeah, you don't know how the algorithm's working for your news feed. You don't know how the government's exactly spending your taxpayer dollars. There's, and the, yeah. That lack of transparency should be pressed, we should be pressing that lack of transparency more and more yes. um, to be able to have a more mm -hmm. open and honest conversation about the algorithms that are controlling our right. behavior and choices. Yeah. I'd like to go just a little further. Yeah. You're very Let's kind. Let, let me go deep. I love the deep, yeah. the deep conversation format that you've created yeah. here, Alan. It's wonderful and rare in the modern age. So my first axiom, if you will, is the idea that an ethical interface is transparent reliably transparent in both uh, what it says and in the reasons why it's saying it. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a second axiom, which is, let's imagine that Google now decides that they want to tell us the reasons behind their top three choices. What mechanism could that follow? It could follow, for example, the same mechanism that we know and love in privacy statements and terms and conditions. 25 pages of stuff that no one's ever going to bother mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. It could be Well, that would be ethical. They would be transparent if they were telling the truth and reliable and yeah. so on. But that wouldn't be very helpful. It, it would no. not be, in my terms, it would not be humane. Yeah, yeah. What True. would be humane would be my ability to ask a question of it. To say, oh, yeah, yeah. you think Luigi's Pizza is better. How do they do on sustainability, on paying minimum wage, yeah, on yeah. gluten-free, on, yeah. on values that I want to bring to the conversation. Yeah. Conversation is extraordinarily efficient mm -hmm. compared to the alternatives. And so I'm promulgating the idea of a conversational interface as being the humane interface because I as participant mm -hmm. on the other side of this thing going on can direct it. It's, we co-participate. Uh -huh. I don't have to listen to you for half an hour to wait for the answer I want. Yeah. I don't have to read 20 pages. I can say, what about this? And yeah. it can come right back. So it's uh, with machine interfaces, the co-participation, the, co the conversation, it creates a hybrid of choice then, mm -hmm. rather than a 
the machine showing you the choice and right. then yeah right. yeah and then you not being able to understand why it's even up there right yeah. i mean conversation has evolved over how many years how long has language been around i've heard 10,000 i don't know don't no, care more 100,000 yeah it, yeah actually yeah. they up the ante yeah. yeah that's true i forget so it works conversation works that was the slogan by the way of my company general that's Cybernetics. good yeah conversation, conversation works. works yeah uh, so why don't we have conversational interfaces this comes up now of course when we're dealing a lot with voice mm -hmm. and that's another yeah whole thing yeah voice is now being unlocked into all yeah. of our homes and yeah um, Ron what do you think about transparency and what are your thoughts about transparency with the algorithms that run our world transparency with the government systems think about it? Yeah, what do you think about the transparency of the systems and our relationship with them? I don't think it's transparent. You asked me what I think about the transparency. I think yeah. uh, we're, it's, there is very little transparency. A lot of people have a hard time with the truth, accepting their own truth, mm. as well as being truthful to others. It's, yeah. we, you know, and it's just, I don't live in denial that I'm being lied to. <laughs> do, you, do you think that this way of systems thinking is helpful for understanding reality? Systems thinking. Thinking about yourself as something that needs to be steered so as you have an interaction with a... Oh, we'll, we'll be steered. <laughs> it's a... This the planet is littered with lost civilizations that have been steered into destruction. And here we are in 2018 with Mars. And will do we deserve to go there? I don't know. I'd love to be optimistic, but uh, I, I, I'm not. That's a really good point, Ron. The civilizations that got steered into destructive mm. directions, mm -hmm. yeah, mm. yeah. And here we are talking about the future technologies that mm -hmm. have the potential to steer us in the wrong directions. Let's, let's segue into that. Sure. So you mentioned that machine intelligence is not always intelligent. And then you've all, we've also been talking about this hybrid choice. Walk us down what some of your thoughts are about these intelligent systems that are able to impact our lives, that do a lot of the logical offloading from ourselves. Yeah. Well, symbiosis is a word that's been around for many years mm -hmm. to describe the relationship between humans and technologies. Um, Engelbart talked about it, Dung Engelbart, of course, very important in the history of interaction design. Uh, and Licklider, J.C.R. Licklider, who I also knew at college for a little while, extraordinary guy, he wrote about man-machine, meaning human-machine symbiosis, gender issue there, which we've fixed since, gender emphasis. Uh, and those ideas are to leave to the machine, what the machine is good at, and to leave to people what people are good at, and to bring them together in this complementary way. And AI, of course, is stupendous at certain kinds of pattern matching, machine learning in particular, the successful AI, let's call it that. People should talk about machine learning. Oh, yes, that's that AI thing that's worked. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, for 50, 60 years, there have been other proposals that really haven't worked very well. And machine learning is, is powerful, for, as I say over and over again, for pattern matching. But it doesn't think the way we think, and it doesn't do what we do. Um, so some domains remain untouched, while some are overtouched. So the media gets a hold of stories, including the tech media, I won't name names, uh, who say, well, you know, uh, computers are better at diagnosing x-rays than people now. Maybe. Maybe not. Let's not go too fast with that. Mm -hmm. Where I'm trying to get to, though, is 
the values that we have as human beings are those that are the most important. And again, as I said earlier with Maturana, we bring the values to the way the technology is used. And if the value is profit and um, two billion users to whatever benefit, then we're, down a, we're far down a slippery slope and can we back out and all of that kind of thing. So th those are the issues there. I love that. We got we to bring the values yeah. as the forefront principle to yeah. the development of the technologies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a choice. As a, as a society interested in growing quarterly profits and uh, growth and big is better than ethics or yeah. whatever it may be, yeah. then that's the problem of the world. That's not the problem of the technology. It's a question of, of where we want to, where we want to, um, where we want to go, what we want, what we need. And that's a huge conversational point that we talk about on here is mm -hmm. the ethical considerations of the economic and financial systems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, but put me back on track, Alan. I, I think you were asking a question about where society is going to go or... Yeah, yeah. And, and so how do we balance out the need for a little bit of ethical consideration in the economic and financial markets while simultaneously needing to uh, continue promulgating innovation and, uh, and invent, yeah, invention. Yeah. So I think... Providing value to people, yeah. So questioning the values behind machine intelligence, the values behind machine learning specifically, and the values behind human society. That's very broadly stated. Um, there's an implied worshiping of zeros and ones when you have the algorithm as the, the ultimate uh, icon, the, the ultimate mm -hmm. uh, talisman, the ultimate thing that you're worshiping. So we believe in algorithms and we trust them and we say that they're great and that's the, the, our future in this internet you know, world that we have. I want to remind us all something that I think we can lay at the feet of Google, at the, at the feet of Larry and Sergey. Because when they started using the word algorithm, they erased the word heuristic. Mm -hmm. And there's an important difference. An algorithm is something that is so well crafted that it always gets you the answer. If you give it the right inputs, it will give you the output. So arithmetic, addition, mm -hmm. division, these are algorithms. You give them two numbers and you get out the answer every time. A heuristic is the situation where mm, not so much where maybe 80% of the time you get a good answer. Mm -hmm. But it's not perfect. Algorithms are perfect. Heuristics are imperfect. Mm -hmm. So losing that word heuristic to describe yeah. what the technology is doing is already deceiving us into thinking we're getting more than we're really getting. Yeah. So the loss of that vocabulary is, I think, unfortunate. Now, I'm not saying that you can't make a machine intelligent in the sense that I meant earlier in relationship. Mm -hmm. of, a, of a particular uh, Man, heuristics are a major aspect of systems thinking. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And, if, and, if, and if, they, if we can be more transparent about how it is just a heuristic. Yes. Yeah, that would help. Even so that's much. a lack of transparency. Thank you for putting it that way. Yeah. That's a lack of transparency. So I also believe that you can have conversations with machines, not like the ones we have today with Alexa. That ain't no conversation. Conversation, again, is one in which things evolve. You learn more. The other side learns more. Yeah, yeah. You create a common context. You have shared values, ultimately, but certainly shared information. So if I say the next day, play the song that you played yesterday, please, Alexa. Notice I can say it at the end as well as at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What a pain. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's not a relationship if I have to start from scratch every time. Yeah, yeah. And that's the major issue with the conversational interfaces we have today. It doesn't create a shared relationship. Yeah. That can be done. That's a database thing. Please focus on that, somebody. Because uh, until you do, I'm going to be really pissed every morning when I get up and I have to repeat the same thing t to Alexa or Siri or Cortana mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. what's the other one from Google, Samsung? Google Home Mini. Google Home. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's Bixby. Bixby. Oh, where, which one's that again? I think it's Samsung. Oh, it's Samsung. Yeah. Everybody's got one. So what am I trying to say? Conversations with machines, I think, when 
they begin to become more like human conversations will be extraordinary. And there are design patterns for those. I've been sitting among them for 40 years. Gordon Pask, who was at the architecture machine at MIT, which is the predecessor to the Media Lab, Nicholas Negroponte hired him, was talking conversation 40 years ago. Mm. And I'm like, that. I don't care what you got over there. That. And I've been following that path for a long time. And maybe Pask is worth a brief excursion, but to try to stay on point. Um, conversational machines, machines that have intelligence in certain situations, human machine symbiosis, these are all fabulous things. Mm -hmm. But what are the values behind them? And unfortunately, the values behind whatever we're doing in any of those areas now are techno values or business mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. They're not humane and ethical values. And until they are, we're going to become the product, as we all say about Facebook, right? Yeah. Rather than the user of the product to our advantage. Yeah. What are your, who, who will be programming ethics into AI and robots? Every damn coder on the planet is going to be programming those things implicitly or explicitly. We had this little flurry recently. Mm -hmm when people said, oh, the algorithm made me do it, or the algorithm, right? The algorithm made the mistake. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, the company says, oh, that was just our algorithm. We didn't make the mistake. Our oh, my goodness, yeah. So we're beyond that now a little bit, right? I think yeah. they got called out for that. Oh, gosh. And, you know, either that's incredibly stupid or incredibly naive, and I don't want either of those ruling the world of these giant domains that are so much... Ron, Ron and I have this ongoing joke yep. that people rarely take blame for mm. their, uh, their own actions. Uh, we, we try and take blame for our own actions as, as often as possible. Um, so what, well, that's ethical. Yeah. Okay. What, 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 about, um, what about artificial intelligence posing an existential threat? Where do you sit on that? Well, others make a living at this. I worry about it a lot. Um, whether it's a drone somewhere that's programmed to do something nasty. Mm -hmm. Whether it's pure surveillance, which yeah. is everywhere and nasty. Every, every, I mean, Alexa knows more about me than I care to admit. Mm -hmm. um, but more serious are the, are the implicit programming, so the prejudice that's involved in judges that use programs mm -hmm. to decide whether or not to incarcerate somebody. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just unconscionable. is not a strong enough word for this kind of thing. But it's everywhere, and the distinction between that and some valuable use is almost indistinguishable because we are not starting from the values and then moving to the technology. We're saying, oh, I can make that. Let's use that. Oh, it will work over here. Fine, that's, let's do that. So we're not value-driven, we're mm -hmm. technology advancement-driven. Yeah. Um, does it have to be dystopian? No. Is it kind of dystopian now? Yeah. Again, that's why I, I should probably read him more carefully before I say this again. But Jaron Lanier seems to be a guy who's saying, these guys say this and these guys say that. So, you know, the people who are scared to death. Uh, about AI and the people who are the opposite extreme, which is, oh, no, we're fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, this, this drives me crazy. Both of these things drive me crazy. They don't make any sense to me. I, I don't really have an articulate response other than to say, can we talk? Yeah. And can we talk about the ethics of it and yeah. what's being driven? And are we starting from thinking the technology is doing something to us or the business should be the rule? Or are we starting from what's humane and what's ethical? And that's where I'm trying to work in, a, in this very modest way in interaction design and saying, well, what is an ethical interface? What is a humane yeah. interface? Yeah. And can we operationalize that? So I'm not some ivory tower guy saying it would be nice if. I'm saying if we follow these patterns, then we might be closer to ethics and humaneness. Yeah. And that, that is so good to have interaction design kind of be that medium of uh, feedback mm -hmm. and then steering and then mm -hmm. over and over again. I really, I really like that about where you come from um, and how we're going to implement this uh, conversation yeah. into the world about these technologies and implementing ethics and values into them. Okay, how about... 
what are what do you what do you think about the global ruling elite? Do you think one exists? Power is clearly concentrated. If that's what you mean by the global ruling elite, then the answer is yes. And should one endeavor to join the elite to make <laughs> impact? I don't know. I, there's no easy answer to that. You know, I grew up at the, uh, I was a little young, but in the 60s, so-called, when, you know, we were all waiting for the revolution to come. I play Che Guevara, by the way, in a show uh, that couldn't go on one night uh, because the theater was full of tear gas in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, because of the demonstrators at the time. So we couldn't go on to talk about a revolutionary because this non-revolution that was taking place outside that we thought was going to make a difference didn't really come. The 60s changed a lot of things, but apparently it didn't change the power base. I don't know how to change the power base. It, I, you know, the, the new awareness of, of a lot of things, Black Lives Matter, um, the whole uh, recent thing in Hollywood, I think, are incredibly important awareness raising things, and maybe there's a change there. But all of this is about changing the power, and I don't know. I don't know how to do that. What do you think about the soci socioeconomic wealth stratification that we currently have? Uh, eight, eight people have as much wealth as the bottom four billion. There's a lot of instability that could come from that. What do you think about that and how we could potentially solve that? I, again, this is way above my pay grade. I think it's appalling and, and unconscionable. And is it irreversible? I don't know. Um, I try and work in the domain that I feel like I have some, th some insights and some hope that by influencing designers to think in ways that are more humane and more ethical is, is really the best I think so too. that I can do. Yeah. And I, I also think a shift from a techno-centric, AI-centric world to a cybernetic centric world, which again is not yeah. bionic implants and not yeah. biomechatronics and not freezing dead people, by yeah. the way. I want to yeah. make sure you know that yeah. it's not freezing dead people. Um, is an important shift because it, it returns us to purpose and it ultimately returns us to yeah. expressing the values by which we want to live and deciding if we want to live together. And if we do, then we would know how to act better. What do you think about how we can maximize human potential? It's an easy answer for me. It's all about conversation. Mm -hmm. So conversation is the foundation of relationship and shared history and trust. Once we trust each other, we're faster at interacting. Mm -hmm. And we can explore possibilities with each other. We can make choices among the options. And we can then coordinate our action. So we can agree that you all design something and I'll build it, or that we will design it together, maybe build it together. Collaboration, cooperation, these are all words that emerge as a consequence of being able to have conversations. And ethical conversations in which we're co-participants are important. That's not to say that I feel like I have value in every single decision. I have a certain range of capabilities. Mm -hmm. My recognizing that and you recognizing that means that we can share the responsibility mm -hmm. and not have everyone in every decision. So there are principles in cybernetics that are actually quite actionable about that, having to do with variety in the conversation and designing a conversation for its variety. So to increase human potential, we could get better at having conversations in yep. which we move forward in a coherent and uh, co-participatory, that's a redundant way of putting it. Yeah. Set of interactions. That is, that's beautifully said. Uh, yeah. We always like to talk about equanimity. We like to talk yeah. about uh, having a growth mindset. We like to yep. talk about understanding people's journey and how they got to where they're at. Yes. All of those aspects are crucial to having a conversation with someone, especially someone that may disagree with you. And that is actually very healthy for conversation if you enable it to be. Um, if you practice having that yeah. tough conversation over and over again. So we've I mean, lost a lot of that, as is often said. I mean, people talk about Washington as not really being cooperative, 
even. Yeah. And Sherry Turkle writes very eloquently on the loss of conversation, her book Reclaiming Conversation, the yeah. title says it all. And our capacity to have conversation is diminished by all of the things going on in the world, a lot of which are technological. But those are consequences of our value systems, of the value systems that create systems that make us go down certain paths. Make us, is that too strong? Yeah, yeah. That encourages us, yeah. that encourage us, that entice us, yeah. that make us addicted to in the Tristan yeah. Harris sense. Yeah, yeah. All right, what do you think about us being alone in the cosmos? I think it's impossible that we're alone. It just seems, I mean, how did we get here? What cybernetics would say is that we got here through evolutionary patterns, processes that move toward higher and higher orders of complexity to the point of the complexity of consciousness and language and society and everything that we're building on the planet, including the stuff that's gonna snuff us out. Uh, those conditions are rare, but the universe is, I think when I last looked, pretty big and more than large enough to have other stuff going on. But the distances involved are kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure we'll ever know. Yeah. And those who dream about that, I think, should be encouraged to dream. Yeah. My focus would more be on the oceans than on the cosmos because that's yeah. near at hand. Yeah. And my, that's my feeling about Mars, if you're about to ask me about that. No. Be nice to go to Mars. Yeah, great. But, you know, I think we should focus on what we're fucking up here before we do something there. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, recently, um, was at an event where I heard that um, Elon's decisions about Mars were actually um, held, held back mm. with his interest of helping make sure Earth is in good um, condition first and then... Good. Yeah. So, completely agreed. Also, oceans are super unexplored, 95% um, yeah. unexplored. There's uh, habitation that we could build on top. There's amazing um, ways that we could live on, uh, on the oceans. So, okay, uh, agreed about the Good. vastness of the cosmos, and I always think about the, uh, the ways that life could have evolved around other stars. So, how about, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? That's such a difficult question. Difficult in the best sense. I have, I have my own bias, of course, we all have our own bias. Yeah. And I think just looking in someone else's eyes is the most beautiful thing. Because it can happen anywhere, it can mean most anything. Mm -hmm. And it's the foundational connection that we have as species. It's a language of its own. That would be my answer. I, I, didn't, I didn't have that, that answer until you just asked me. I love that answer. That's why we like keeping it I hadn't, sporadic too. I have not prepared that. That's such a good one. Because you're right, it can be something as short as just a glance yeah. and it can speak so much how yeah. uh, and it's a gateway to the soul there's a yep. the spirit yeah there's yep. so much there and and it's so available and so underused yeah you know it's something to be absolutely cultivated absolutely um i, I love speaking with the eyes if you yeah. just, just talk about that there, you don't even need to make any vocal noises at somebody yeah. you can just <laughs> And yes. You can communicate a whole language that way. Yes. And all right, how about are we in a computer simulation? If I weren't worried about your rug, I would have spit out the water just now. You know, I think that's a really stupid question. I don't think, I don't think you're stupid for asking it, but I think it's a stupid question. And ex ex expand on that. Why? It's so unnecessary. Well, first of all, it's unnecessary. You know Occam's razor, mm -hmm. which says the simplest explanation is always the one that, always the one, is the most likely mm -hmm. one to be true. Um, no, I don't think we're in a simulation. Uh, I don't think it would be possible to simulate this. You don't think it's possible to no. simulate this? Why? I will claim again, as I mentioned in passing, that it's possible to make a mechanism that's intelligent the way the brain is, because the brain is a mechanism. Again, I don't think anyone has a clue to that. I think this guy Gordon Pask has a pattern for it and has a lot of proposals that haven't been followed um, at all. But um, 
I just think it's unbearably complex and it's easier to do it than to simulate it. So why, why would we add a layer of complexity on top of something that we can just be? Okay. Is that satisfying? Yeah, yeah, that, of that, course, that, of that, course. That's my answer. Yes, yes, of course. Um, all right, and we have this fun game that we got. Uh -oh. um, now, this, I'm, now I'm frightened. This is a 100 questions. Uh, categories are love and relationships, oh my God. sex, personality, and emotions. Did I sign up for this? Well, you, 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 didn't, um, you didn't put the category. I mean, the categories are... Um, Oh, well, yeah. well, well, we'll be able to find them. Okay. Work and money, travel, life and death, self, family and friendships, culture and taste. What are you thinking? You want to pick one? Pick a category. Oh, I want to pick self, of course. You want to pick self? Sure. All right, what's the sign? What's the graphic for that? All right, cool. It's a little human thinking. Let's find the self. I assume this, this is the epistemological self and not the me self. I think so. I think so. Let's see. We are right almost there. Here we are. Okay. All right. Let's 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 give you a couple options here. Do 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 do. All right. We, we don't have a hard stop, do we? I, I do want to put in a plug for something at the end. We will. We will. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, Paul. What's your question? Is there an art to loading the dishwasher? <laughs> Is there an art to loading the dishwasher? What a softball question. I mean, <laughs> you know, ask me a hard question sometime. Of course there's an art to loading the dishwasher. All right, let's hear about the art. There's an art in every action, in every process. It's a question of whether we choose to accept the mission. I love loading the dishwasher as if it were an art. And I don't mm -hmm. mean some kind of anal retentive, you know, pattern that I follow every mm -hmm. single time but it's a, an act of gracefulness yeah. and an act of mindfulness and a necessary boring, horrible act that I can turn into a work of art. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I try to every day. If we dance through the universe, then this becomes fun. That's Th right. That was interesting. The question is, who's playing the music? Yeah, who's playing the music? Yeah, hopefully each individual person's vibing at their own frequency. That's right. You're not forcing me to take a particular yeah, one, Yeah, yeah, take, take, take. No, no I had the feeling that you were trying to feed me. A oh, I took two. Yeah, give me the one that you haven't seen, the top oh, one. There you go, okay, yeah. Okay. Do people envy you? I doubt it, and Do I... Do people envy you? <laughs> I doubt it, and I have no idea. Okay. What is uh, the plug? So the plug I wanted to mention is I'm doing a project at the College for Creative Studies. Yes. Called the Colloquy 2018 Project. Okay. And I doubt that you'll be able to see this, but Gordon Pask, 50 years ago, did an exhibit at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London, which consisted of these mobiles. Some were male figures and some were female figures. I saw this figures. photo, yeah. yeah. Explain this, yeah. Well, so they rotate on their own axis and they make sounds and shine lights. And under certain circumstances, they stop and they coordinate with each other and they have a relationship that's brief. And then after a while, they're satisfied and they keep going. Fifty years ago, he was exploring the idea of machines talking to machines. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. a human being could come into the gallery with a flashlight or block the light that's there or make sounds and try to interact with the thing. But it was fundamentally machines talking to machines. So we've raised about 80% of the money to build this between now and May at the College for Creative Studies, in which we're going to reproduce what it was and how it worked. Ah. Full size, full scale. It's about 12 feet by 12 feet. Okay. But because we're not going to reproduce the technology he used 50 years ago, we're using Arduino uh -huh. and, and you know, very complex sensors and all kinds of things, we can reprogram it. We can cool. program it with voice, with AI, with cloud computing, with all of these other things. So the students who have been doing the archaeology of understanding how it kind of worked, mm -hmm. there's a movie, there's some flowcharts, there's some descriptions, they've plumbed the history and tried to re produce how it worked then, and they're still in the process of building it. But also they can reprogram it in 2018. So if male, female robots were interacting with each other in a certain way in 1968, how might they interact with each other today? And so we're expecting to open in May. We've been cool. invited to bring it to other places. Good. The ZKM uh, Arts and Media Institute in Karlsruhe, Germany has asked that we bring it there. I'm visiting the Exploratorium later Good. on this trip. Good. 
some substantial portion of the entire exhibition, the entire exhibition was called Cybernetic Serendipity. And this piece, nice. Gordon Pask's piece, was called Colloquy, as in colloquium or conversation yeah, of correct, mobiles. Correct. So he was talking about conversational machines 50, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. before we even imagined yeah, that yeah, they would yeah. be able to talk exactly. to them. Exactly. So I just want people to know, and they can write to me and ask about this. Um, well, um, yeah. the, the project itself, is it going through a uh, a fundraiser right now? Yes. Cool. And yes. then what's the, we'll, we'll throw the link in the bio. That'd be great. For them as well. Yes. People at home. That'd be um, wonderful. Nice. This is, this is good. I'm glad that you're working on yeah. a big project like this with the yeah. team. And worldwide there are these uh, events about the 50th anniversary of the whole show from the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London. And so there's National Academy of Sciences having something. There's a, uh, one of these things I've given you is a paper submitted to a Liverpool, University of Liverpool yeah. conference yeah, yeah. On, the, on the history of, of AI and social um, behavior, things like that. Anyway, thank you for letting yeah. me do that. Yeah, this is great. Uh, I'm really happy that you guys are working on this. Um, and yeah, we'll go ahead and put the link in the bio. Definitely great. give them a look. Beautiful. So we want to thank everyone for tuning in. We really yeah. appreciate it. Um, you can follow Paul Pangaro on Twitter. Um, just first name, last name on Twitter. Uh, you can visit his website, just pangaro.com. Um, all of his awesome content is on there. We have a lot of other great content that's up and coming. If you guys find this content useful, like, comment, subscribe, share it with other people. Become a patron, get access to exclusive events, exclusive content, and uh, guest Q&A. So much more, check us out there. Thank you to Ron Vargas, our producer and director, Thank for you, doing Ron. an amazing job. Thank you, Ron. Is it really, it's only five minutes have gone by since we started, right? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, only know, five you, minutes have gone by. That's the thing about good conversation. Exactly, exactly. And merch, merch coming soon. Get your, get your, are we in a computer simulation merch <laughs> and all this other good stuff that's coming up. And thanks for tuning in and we'll be back tomorrow. See ya. Yeah. Thank you. Really great.